correct order. Do it now. And we mentioned that, uh, or, or uh, Phelps mentions that they captured the steamer, Confederate steamer Eastport being converted into a gunboat in Cerro Gordo and Hardin County. This is what the uh, Eastport looked like. Uh, the photo was of it at Helena, Arkansas in 1864 after it was fully refitted as a gunboat. And the bottom is a little bit more clear drawing of what it looked like. And as I said, Lieutenant Commander Seth Phelps, who had commanded the Conestoga, up to 1862 was later given command of the Eastport. So he sort of got a promotion to that ship because ever since he had captured her, he had her eye on that ship. And they gave him command of it. And this is an article called Lincoln Gunboats on the Tennessee River. And in this, it's, it's amazing how when the newspapers got wind of what had happened, they sort of blew out of proportion what Phelps had actually reported. Mm. So they say in this article from the Huntsville, Alabama Democrat, quote, we have made it our special business to find out what aid the enemy got from Fort Henry to Florence and as yet have heard of only one man who at Florence went down and showed them where to land and took bacon for the service and hauled it away after, after night. So they don't name who this guy was, but apparently there was one man, I don't know if he was a local or from somewhere else, they told the the U.S. Navy officers where they could come ashore. He's he's named in that other. Office. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so I his name was, yeah, his name was Hyde. Okay, Hyde. Mm -hmm. I wish I I must have missed that one. I would have put that in here. We have to try to research him. Well, I'll tell you I'll tell you about him later. But he's, yeah, I I got that one you sent, but I, I must have missed the other one. How that spell? H I D E or no H Y D E. -D -E. His son ended up being a newspaper editor in. Uh, okay, in, that's the guy you were. I did see that, and I forgot. Okay, now I know. Now I know, now I know. Now I know what he's. Yeah. Okay, I'm with you now. Okay. Here locally, well, where, yeah. Yeah. The newspaper editor where? Yeah, he was. He was an uh, editor over here in the late 1800, early 1900. Yeah. yeah. Now I now I did get that one. I just didn't connect it with this for some stupid reason because I'm a little slow. Well, uh, in, since we're on the subject of, of unionist loyalty with this, this guy Hyde who showed the Union Navy where to land, in his February 10th, 1862 report, Lieutenant Commander Phelps wrote that, quote, we have met with the most gratifying proofs of loyalty everywhere across Tennessee and in the portions of Mississippi and Alabama we visited most affecting, I'm sorry, and in the portions of Mississippi and Alabama we visited most affecting instances greeted us almost hourly. Men, women, and children several times gathered in crowds of hundreds and shouted their welcome and hailed their national flag with an enthusiasm there was no mistaking. It was genuine and heartfelt. In Tennessee, the people generally in their enthusiasm braved secessionists and spoke their views freely, but in Mississippi and Alabama, what was said was guarded. Quote, if we dared express ourselves freely, you would hear such a shout greeting your coming as you never heard. We know there are many unionists among us, but a reign of terror makes us afraid of our shadows, unquote. Well, according to the New York Times, when the papers got a hold of Phelps' report, the New York Times on February 13th reported that, quote, the people of Florence are so delighted in finding the stars and stripes once more giving protection to them that they were prepared to give a grand ball to the officers of the gunboats, but they could not remain to accept of their courtesies. Phelps doesn't mention being faded with a ball. But apparently the New York Times thought the pro-union sentiment, and by the way, there was a lot of pro-union sentiment in Florence Lauderdale. Our secession delegates to the secession convention in Montgomery, as you all I'm sure know, in 1861, were only in favor of secession as a last resort and all the Confederate states together. They were Douglas supporters and not the more conservative Breckenridge supporters. So we were, one, one uh, newspaper correspondent described Florence Lauderdale, or Lauderdale County, as the slowest of the hesitating counties to embrace secession. So it doesn't surprise me that there could be a bunch of unionists that turned out to greet the Union Navy when it debarked. Now, not quite as, you know, to the level that the New York Times and the Philadelphia Press said. The Philadelphia Press wrote, 
that the inhabitants of Florence tendered the officers of the gunboat a complimentary ball and large numbers expressed themselves as willing to enlist. And according to uh, Lieutenant Commander Phelps, there were whole communities of secessionists who fled at their approach. And that was confirmed by Barr, who says that several Florentines, when, the, when they were certain the gunboats were gonna land, you know, they, they headed for the county with all their movable goods. And Lieutenant Commander Phelps reported that Lieutenant Commander Gwynn of the USS Tyler had enlisted, quote, some 25 Tennesseans, unquote. However, the Philadelphia Press upped that number to 250. So I don't know where they got 250 as opposed to 25. But they got a little bit, and there's a war on, and it's, we talk about fake news and yellow journalism now. This is 1862. Yeah. So. Uh, things were chronicled in the Athens Post of February 11, 1862. The Athens Post noted that the steamer Dunbar was sunk in Cypress Creek and several other steamers were sunk. With the, the Sarah Gordo and Sally Ward were the only two captured by the Federals to rob escaped. So, I mean, that's not too far from us. And this is the, from the Daily Evening Express from Lancaster City, Pennsylvania. Even in Pennsylvania, they're, they're keeping tabs on what's going on in our corner of the world. From March 14, 1862, yeah. And they know from the Memphis papers that the steamer Dunbar, instead of escaping, was really sunk in Cypress Creek to prevent her capture. So there had been, I mean, one, one account says that in 1861, the eight steamers that the Confederate Congress had appropriated money to buy could not be converted into gunboats fast enough, so one report said they were all burned, which was not true. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't surprise me that there was miscommunication about what actually happened to the gun bar. Hey, but man. they confirmed, the Memphis papers confirmed that it actually was sunk on, on Cypress Creek. Hey, Glenn, did you ever give your thoughts on those 27 submarine batteries on there? Yeah, but I don't know enough about the technicalities of that. That's, that's, that's that. another name for torpedoes. They were, yeah, like Rodney called them. That's kind of what I thought. Yeah, and they, they note that the steamer time commanded by Colonel William A. Johnson had $100,000 worth of government stores. Uh, Captain William A. Johnson later served in Rodney's 4th Alabama Cavalry. He was a steamboat captain of the time, and he had $100,000 worth of merchandise taken from his ship. Yeah, time is money. Now, this is the Memphis and Charleston Railroad Bridge that actually was burned in April of 1862 by Confederate Colonel Benjamin Harden Helm of the 1st Kentucky Cavalry under orders. And incidentally, he was the nephew of First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln. Which is interesting that Commander Phelps said the railroad bridge is not a military target. We don't, we're not going to burn it. But later, just a few months later in April, it actually was burned by the Confederates. It, it actually was pretty important, but Phelps was a Navy man, and he said even if the bridge wasn't there, we couldn't get any higher up the river, so we're not going to burn it. But the Confederate military... Yeah, Helm later commanded the orphan brigade, yeah. which uh, killed the second officer. Yeah, he didn't, he yeah. didn't survive the war. Now, this is interesting. This is an excerpt from uh, Silas G. Barr's February 12th, 1862 account of the sinking of the Dunbar. The steamer Dunbar, a large, fine, side-wheel steamer, was chased to our landing by the gunboat from Fort Henry, but succeeded in getting away and run up a little creek, not a thousand miles, maybe it means a thousand feet, or maybe yeah, yeah, one mile, a thousand feet anyway, so. but anyway, and is now lying at the Gundle Ford in 15 or 20 feet water. She was scuttled and settled down nicely. The raw of our Samuel Ward was also scuttled and sunk, so we... That's very important, Gundle Ford. This is 1862, Silas G. Barr calls it Gundle Ford. So keep that in the back of your mind. So when Sandra Sockwell did her 1984 PhD dissertation, the place names of Colbert and Lauderdale counties, Alabama, she notes the folklore that was recounted by Mrs. Darby in her 1962 Tri-Cities Daily article but she also notes the Florence Gazette article from 1862 and the fact that Editor Barr called it the Gundle Ford. Yeah. Now, 
Now, where was the Gundel Ford? The best I could figure out, and Greg can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but this is where I think it was. That's where it was, yeah. So West, College, Col yeah, West College, right there at the end of West College Street, and runs into Gunnelford Road, and now we'll see some others. This is a, an aerial photo from the county's tax assessor's maps without the tax stuff on there. That's so this is what it, that, that, that crossing looks like. That's pretty neat, Sarah. I got, a, I got a few of those, just different views of it. And well, some of it, these are Google. That first one was from the tax list, the, the tax, Lauderdale County tax assessor's map site. But these are Google, I forgot I got these off of Google. So that's where they're scraping farms dead end down there, I mean. Yeah, you can see the road. Which way, which way is east and west there? Uh, east would be, I think, west would be north in, that, in this picture. Go back to that one. So north is to the top of the well, map. Okay, and I'm west east and west. On west College yeah. where you're showing the yeah. crossing that on those last two. So Google it, maps. west would be this way. way. Yeah, I know. You're Not talking about, about when you oriented it. Okay. Uh, Keep on going. Yeah, yeah you're talking about. Right there, yeah. <coughs> That's what he's talking about. Oh, that that, one. One. that, that one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure, but I think west would be up. Yeah. West is up. Uh, yeah. Well, the federal victory at Shiloh in April of 1862 opened up the Tennessee Valley of invasion, and just 10 days later, Union forces occupied Tuscumbia. Now, we're, we're shooting up to 18, April 1862. Union forces occupied Tuscumbia in April, and on April 23rd, Lieutenant Commander William T. Gwynn reported to his superiors, Quote, Sir, I have the honor to inform you that on the 21st I proceeded in this vessel as high up the Tennessee River as Florence, Alabama, capturing the steamboat Alfred Robb, which has been used as a rebel transport on the upper part of the river, not having been sunk as we supposed. Burning the Dunbar, which had been used as a gunboat previous to the fall of Fort Henry, I found the Dunbar some distance up Cypress Creek, which is two miles below Florence, Alabama, sunk, the water being above her guards, it was impossible for me to raise her. And the, and the rob was hidden, if people don't know, the rob was hidden in Tank Creek. Where was he? It was hidden in Spring Creek? Tank Creek. Tank Creek. And I don't know why I've got this on here and so quick, but just that Gundle Ford reference from the Florence Gazette. So, a lot of people have written about where the name Gunwellford Road came from, Gunwellford Road came from, and how do you spell it or pronounce it? Well, it's had a dozen different spellings and pronunciations, as you can see from these Florence Banner articles of February 13th and September 11th, 1890, talking about bids for the Iron Bridge across Cypress Creek at Gunwall Ford, or Gunwell Ford, that's one way they spelled it. Then by July 9th of 1890, the Florence Herald was spelling it Gunnell, Gunnell, Gunnell Ford Bridge west of the city. They're definitely hooked on phonics. <laughs> right. And so finally, by September 10th, 1890, the same newspaper spells it Gunnell Ford Bridge. So the Herald can't make up its mind how to spell it. But by the 1920s and 30s, it most often shows up like this, Gunnell Ford. Sometimes it's combined as one word, usually it's two, before the mid-20th century. And this is a, from a 1923 engineer's map, revised 1940, which shows that Gunwell Ford or Gunford Road Bridge right there. You can see that. There was a bridge there at one time. And this, this map was drawn in 1923 and revised in 1940. And they got it spelled Gunwell Ford Two words. Well, I want to go back to Captain Fowler for a minute. When the Dunbar got scuttled, what happened to him? Well, I had a lot of fun researching what happened to him. And at some point after February 1862, 
Captain Gus Fowler somehow made it back to Kentucky where he enlisted in General John Hunt Morgan's 2nd Kentucky Cavalry. Now, I couldn't find service records for Captain uh, Fowler in Hunt's outfit. I couldn't find anybody, any records of Hunt's outfit on Fall Fred. I know they gotta be somewhere. But in May of 1862, Fowler was among those captured by Union General Dumont. He captured several of Morgan's guys. Reporting on his capture, of Fowler's capture, the Evansville, Indiana Daily Journal wrote that, quote, Gus Fowler was not a rebel at heart and that he was forced into the rebel service by the circumstances in which he was placed. We regret since he felt compelled to take up arms against the government that he did not join another portion of the rebel army instead of a gang of guerrilla plunderers, unquote. So he didn't really want to be a Confederate, but he was forced to. The Nashville Union disagreed, however, in an article from May 30th, 1862. It reported that Captain Fowler's father, Judge Wiley P. Fowler, who publicly had stated his refusal to choose sides in the war, was arrested in Marion County, Kentucky, with a, a group of lawyers while holding court after his, their refusal to take an oath of loyalty to the U.S. government on the grounds that such an oath was unconstitutional. The Nashville Union stated that, quote, the bench is no place for rebels. Judge Fowler is the father of the notorious Gus Fowler of Paducah, unquote. Okay. So one says he's not really a, a rebel. The other one says he's a notorious rebel. Yeah. And I'm not sure. I mean, it seems like the Fowlers went Confederate very, very early in the war, and it doesn't seem like there was much coercion to it. But as I said, eventually Captain Fowler was captured by General uh, forces under General Dumont in 1862, and I think I saw a source that says he went to one of the Union POW camps, maybe Douglas, I can't remember. I should have had that slide in here. And that's the article that says, we have always understood that Gus Fowler was not a rebel at heart. So I don't know if he really was. I kind of think he was a little bit more pro-Confederate than that paper wanted to admit. Um, let's see. Yeah. Well, Captain Fowler died in June of 18. Well, no, this is where they reported him dead. The Evansville Daily Journal on June 3rd, 1862, reported him killed. And then Captain Fowler telegraphed his father, who got word to the, to the Daily Journal that he was not, in fact, dead. Again, there's a war on, so I'm sure reports like that happen pretty frequently. And this is the Idlewild that Captain Fowler owned and captained after the war. <laughs> um, in the Fowler Brothers uh, Steamboat Company that they owned, he was head of the firm of Fowler Brothers and Company, Captain Fowler was after the war. And then Captain Luton Augustus Gus Fowler died Monday, August 10th, 1878, at home in Paducah of heart disease. And he's buried in the Oak Grove Cemetery in Paducah. But that's not the end of the Dunbar, even though it was burned. There, uh, a guy wrote articles for the Florence Times after the war he wrote a column called Random Ramblings, where he would talk about various different topics and subjects. And his pen name was the Bohemian. And from what I can tell by what he says about himself, he seems to have been a Union veteran. And in this article from Friday, April 3rd, 1908, the Bohemian reports in part of his article, quote, the Dunbar was later floated and taken over Muscle Shoals to Chattanooga or the Confederates used her as a transport. The steamer later fell into the hands of the Federals when they occupied Chattanooga and the territory thereabouts. Well, that seems to be exactly what happened, but we'll get to that in time. We're nearly done, we just got a little bit longer to go. But the Bohemian seems to be right, because uh, in this slide we can see that on January 7, 1863, Colonel W.W. Sanford, United States, reported to his superior Colonel Rollins, quote, a man just from Florence, Alabama, reports that Lottie, 
General Philip Dale has raised the steamboat Dunbar, sunk our gunboats last winter, and is trying to fix up her engines. And on February 24th, 1863, Lieutenant Commander Leroy Fitch of the gunboat USS Fairplay reported to his superiors, quote, I sent the St. Clair, Brigham, and Rob on up to the foot of Big or Great Muscle Shoals about six miles above with the hope of catching the Dunbar at the foot of them, but I'm sorry to say the rebels succeeded in getting her above the shoals there uh, three or four days before we got up. They haven't had to rise that much ahead of us. So he was chasing the Dunbar in 1863, but it escaped. And then by March 3rd, 1863, General Gribble Dodge is reporting to Major General Rosecrans that, quote, a heavy cavalry force crossed at Decatur, Alabama, to the south side of the river by the steamer Dunbar to cut off my force. And then Lieutenant Commander Fitch reporting again on February 7th, 1864, now commanding the gunboat USS Moose, reported to Rear Admiral David D. Potter at Cairo, Illinois, that I'm visiting Bridgeport, Alabama, quote, I found there on the stocks one large side wheel boat ready for launching as soon as the water would permit. She is 175 feet long and 25 feet beam and will be very serviceable for a transport, but too large for a gunboat. As it is the intention there to put the Dunbar's engines in her, I presume she will be ready for service within one month or six weeks. And that is the last reference I can find to the Dunbar in the official record for the Union Navy or for the Navy or the Army. Greg may have seen one that I've missed. That wouldn't surprise me, but that's the last one I can find. I think I saw one where she was burnt at Chattanooga or shelled at Chattanooga, but I have to go back and look at it. But that was when, that was yeah. before Chickamauga, when the uh, Union forces took over. Well, the this last slide is pretty sad. It's from the Chicago Tribune yeah. of Monday, August 28, 1865, government sales where the U.S. government is selling off steamboats, barges, and shipyards. And if you can see their side wheel steamer Dunbar wrecked. They don't know how what the tonnage is anymore, but it was for sale. And I don't know from documentation who bought it, if anybody bought it, or what they did with it. But in his article on the Dunbar, Turner Rice notes that the hole became a floating sawmill for a few years after the war. But otherwise, I don't know what happened to I it from any official the, records. They didn't show the tonnage on the Dunbar. Like yeah, the they apparently it was so wrecked out that they didn't even bother to list the tonnage. And wow. they specifically note that it's a wreck. You know, yeah. probably one of those, you know, as is, you know, what you get is what you see is what you get. So that's the What's story the of the Confederate off? steamer Dunbar and it's uh, getting stuck on uh, at the Gungle Ford uh, it's at the mouth of Cypress Creek. So if anybody's got any quick questions, otherwise I'll turn it back over to John. Oh, that was great.